welcome. Uh, thank you for coming tonight to our, uh, our deer forum to hear a little bit more about how we're going to handle our deer management issues here in Iowa City. Um, just by way of introduction, I'm Bill Campbell. I'm a captain with the Iowa City Police Department. The people who you sit at, see sitting up here uh, with, the, with the different uh, name tags are part of the deer committee that the council has established to seek your input. And that's uh, primarily why we're here tonight. We're also going to be providing some information, getting some information from you about how you feel about this and, uh, and, and trying to come up with a dialogue back and forth with some things. I'm going to outline a little bit about how this, how we're going to do things this evening. Uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to hear from folks, but again, we want to be able to provide some information too because we know that's what you came for. Um, you'll see in the packets there, uh, and we'll make reference to that here at times as we go through. If you haven't seen the paperwork, um, there's some that are floating around out there. I don't know that there's copies for everyone. Um, but you'll see some information there that will be referred to that will give you some historical documentation as far as what's gone on. The way things will go tonight, uh, the way we're going to structure things, we're going to start off at the beginning here with a little bit of a, a history of what's gone on in the last 20 years in deer management here in Iowa City. Uh, additionally, uh, then we're going to hear from uh, uh, Tony uh, DiNicola, uh, Dr. DiNicola from White Buffalo, who conducted the count that we did earlier this spring uh, surrounding where we sit as far as the number of deer in Iowa City. Could you give you a little bit of sense of that? Um, uh, Dr. DiNicola is also going to talk then a bit about how uh, the management has been done in the past, how the management could be done here in the future. Uh, so that'll be the first section of, of time that we spend. Uh, that'll be the first 15, 20 minutes or so. And then after that, we'll move on to more of a public comment section of it. You'll have a chance to come up. Uh, you'll have a chance to to speak. We're going to limit comments to three minutes. Uh, at that point, if you have a, a question, we'll certainly uh, we'll, we'll have a scribe that will write that down. You'll see it appear on the screen. Um, and then we'll take questions. We'll, we'll take public comment for uh, a while, at least till we have a chance to have people be heard. And then uh, we'll save a section at the end where we'll answer those questions. We'll come back around, whether it be city staff or whether it be Dr. Nina Cola can, uh, can uh, address some of the questions that you have. So that's kind of what things will look like tonight. Um, um, again, the idea is that we would be providing you with information on what the city has found out uh, over the last 20 years and then more recently uh, in the studies more recently. And then also we would have a chance then to hear from you about what your opinions are about how we should handle this, whether we have a problem, how we should be looking at it and so forth. There will be a variety of, uh, of opinions represented in the room. Um, it's this committee's job to then in turn hear what you have to say and get that information back to council so they can make informed decisions about how they want to proceed with the management of, uh, of our deer here in the future. So having said that, I'm going to turn it over to Assistant City Attorney Sue Dulick, who will, will give us a little bit of a history of what's gone on um, since the late 1990s uh, through today. Well, Mike Bill, thank you for coming. Um, and uh, so uh, it has been a, over 20 years when council first uh, looked at this issue. I, think it was, I believe it was 1996. And I had provided the city council a, a short memo on the history. And I just want to I'll go over it just real briefly. But I think that is floating around. So a little over 20 years ago, council got some city staff and some members of the community together and to talk about deer management. And they met uh, and met and met and met, did a tremendous amount of work. And I believe Jan Ashman may have been there from the beginning. Um, with those meetings, and they came back and they made a decision then to bring the numbers down, not manage them as they were, but to call the numbers down by means of, uh, of sharpshooting. And for about 10 years, from roughly 2000 to 2010, the city contracted with White Buffalo, uh, Dr. Di Nicola's uh, uh, company, to uh, to sharpshoot deer. And that can only be done with the permission of the uh, state. The state controls uh, the, the deer. And so it's actually done through the Department of Natural Resources. And they have a commission called the um, Natural Resources Commission. So each year, the city would go and ask for permission for the sharpshooting. And each year, it, it was granted. And in about 19, or year uh, 2010, the numbers got down to where city staff thought that that was a manageable number, was meeting kind of the goals at the time. The city was divided up into some districts, and, um, and the idea was to bring them down on average to about 25 per acre in those districts. 
Well, then, so the city stopped sharpshooting and stopped managing, and then the deer kind of went up. And in the last year or so, staff began receiving complaints. Um, people started talking to members of the city council. And so then staff thought, well, gee whiz, how many deer are out there? And in the past, what city staff has done is they worked with the Department of Natural Resources, and they did a helicopter count. And that's no longer available to the city, the, the helicopter and the DNR services. So the city contacted contracted with Dr. Di Nicola's uh, firm, and they did count via cameras, and he will explain how he did that. Clearly, numbers are up uh, uh, again. And so city council then talked about this at one of their work sessions in March and instructed city staff to do two things. One was to go back to the state uh, this spring and ask to sharpshoot this winter. And secondly, to uh, establish a, or reestablish a, a deer committee um, to start talking about these issues again. But, uh, and so what happened was, because of the timing, uh, we went to the state uh, quite quickly. And there was a letter also that's floating around from the city manager that was the request to the state to sharpshoot this winter. And uh, at the May meeting, the uh, Natural Resources Commission uh, denied the request. Uh, they said we could come back again later this fall, but one of the things they wanted was a public forum or more public input on this issue. And that's what brings us here today, um, is that uh, request by the state to, ha to hear from folks. And so there's some city staff members and some members of the community uh, got a committee together to hear from you folks, and as Bill said, uh, after tonight we'll hear from people um, and report back to the city council, and then city council will will make a decision on where to go from from here. So, um, what we'll do next is we'll hear from Dr. Dina Cola. Um, who did a count on where we currently are with, with deer. And, and to give a little bit of history, and he'll talk more about himself, um, Tony's been involved with the deer process since the late 1990s here in Iowa City. So I, Iowa City's not a, a stranger to him by any means. He knows the town well. He knows many of you probably well as well. Um, so he'll talk a little bit more about the count at where it stands right now, and then go into, again, um, some deer management options from his perspective, what he sees as being options. Good evening, everybody. Faces that still have some interest in the issue. Um, it's gonna be a little challenging. I'm gonna try to mix my exchange with with y'all and as as well as the panel, just so we can have a little bit of uh, space. Oh, that's right. And I need the mic for being official. Just, we are taping this for City Channel 4, and it will be available um, on the City Channel 4. It's not live, but you'll be able to view it. So I just reminded uh, Tony to speak into the mic. So sorry to interrupt. There are some familiar faces here. Um, <coughs> I want to keep this short so that everyone here has an opportunity this evening to make comment um, to the committee um, and give your feedback on your relative perspective. How many of you are familiar with the program that took place um, over 10 years ago? Okay. All right, so most of you are pretty familiar with the earlier process and uh, and then, but I'll still spend a little bit of time for those that aren't familiar with some of the deer management issues um, and how some of those problems are resolved. Um, briefly, I have a, a small nonprofit research organization. Um, we've been established since 1995. Uh, we've worked in uh, 27 states in the country on various species and various issues. Um, we've worked in seven countries around the world. Um, we spend a lot of time um, looking at alternative means of managing suburban deer populations. Uh, in particular, a part of my PhD dissertation was on uh, developing injectable um, chemicals to prevent reproduction in deer. Uh, I've continued along that vein, and, and sadly, uh, we haven't seen any advancement 
um, that brings injectable agents into a practical realm uh, in open environments like, like Iowa City. Um, so I've been researching. I've had uh, 11 different uh, study sites throughout the country. Um, we're surgically sterilizing female deer um, just so we can get a better understanding of what the population impacts would be if we inhibit reproduction in a high percentage of a local population. And I'm uh, going to be submitting that uh, for publication here this fall. So we, we, I've managed seven different controlled hunts. Um, so we're actively involved in, in hunting integration into management. Uh, there's really nothing we haven't done relative to deer and, and deer research. Um, so just have a little background. Um, I know I'm getting old when I've come back to a community that I've worked in and I'm starting over almost from square one. Harold's laughing at me. Um, but uh, um, so it is an interesting process. Most of the communities we work in, um, they're bigger. And um, we have maintained those population control measures every year, at least every other year. Um, where once we had met goals back in 2009, 2010, um, we've lapsed long enough where the population has increased. Um, and everyone's forgotten, except for Sue, she's the only familiar face, So, uh, and some of the residents. So a um, little bit of revisiting, but I'm happy to spend the time, and later I'll answer some of your questions regarding uh, what, what your options are. Uh, and just a, a revisiting. Um, I don't um, advocate uh, for management, really. I'll go through these population numbers, but they don't mean anything to me. Only you know how many deer in your community are appropriate. So I don't make those suggestions. I don't make suggestions on how you want to solve that problem. I'll just guide you uh, through the process. Um, OK, so <clears throat> as you know, you're experiencing some of these same problems that most communities do once you have an abundance of deer. Um, you do have Hickory Hill Park, which is a nice established open space. Um, there's some larger properties uh, in your community that are being impacted. Um, we've seen a, a fairly significant, almost a 60% increase in deer vehicle collisions over the last couple of years. And <clears throat> Excuse me, and then um, there's clearly, and there always has been, uh, impacts to uh, landowner landscaping, um, which is more an individual uh, concern for many of the residents, I'm sure, in, in the community. Um, and what brings us here tonight is this fine schematic. Um, everyone, when you say deer, everyone has an opinion. Everyone, even if you don't ask for it. So, um, and everyone has their own perspective on how many deer you should have, how you may want to manage them, the relative um, acceptability of various methods. So that's what we're here to, to chat on tonight. Uh, most of my focus, that's for you to discuss with the, with the panel. Um, my focus is to really get through uh, some of uh, the data that we collected so you can get a rough understanding of how we came to those population estimates. All right, so there's three primary ways. Um, um, and as Bill said, um, the state used to um, uh, kind of collaborate and cooperate with us, and they would do snow counts. And it wasn't so bad for them because they're local. Sometimes you get four inches of snow, and two days later it's melted. So for someone like me to come from the East Coast and time it with an appropriate snowfall, this is, is just isn't feasible. So we kind of gave up on snow counts probably 10 years ago. And we're focused on either spotlighting methods, which is basically driving through a designated area. You observe deer, you measure the distance to those deer, and then there's a statistical software package that will uh, project population densities. Um, it's not as practical when you start getting in the areas where we survey, which is basically east of Dubuque to the line down to Rochester. You have bigger properties. You'll, I don't know if Larson still has their parcel there, but you know you have ACT. You know some of those bigger properties are harder to access with a spotlight and really get good estimates. So uh, what we have used and it's been shown to be pretty reliable is. Um, um, just using uh, basic trail cameras that most hunters use to see what's in the field, uh, except we use them a little more systematically. Um, from a scientific perspective, in order to estimate populations, uh, we often want to tag animals so you know, because all deer kind of look the same, right? Most female deer can't tell them apart. Um, and so we used to capture animals, put tags in them, and that helps us more accurately estimate deer abundance. Um, well, there's a reasonably clever method um, that some folks down south came up with probably 20 years ago where they use, that might help you, um, they use 
male deer with antlers um, to serve as in individuals, right? We need to be able to know how many individuals of a subset of that population there are. And so what we do is we put these cameras, we bait the animals, get them acclimated to coming to those locations so we can get a lot of pictures. Um, and then we sort through all those pictures to determine the ratio uh, of animals uh, in that environment. And we've used this in many areas. We've compared it to snow counts. We've compared it to spotlighting. Uh, we've compared it in areas where I literally have almost every deer tagged. So we have known populations. And it gives us pretty reasonable uh, outputs on population estimates. Um, these are the locations where our cameras are placed. Um, sorry, there's some property names on there. Um, but we basically went over from Dubuque, um, east of the line, and then down towards Rochester, where the kind of the, the core abundance has been historically. Um, and it would give us you know, a good sample area, a block of area, where we can give some consistent population projections. Um, the fun part starts when you have 10,324 pictures. Um, and we had over 20,000 pictures, but you have to take out all the squirrels. And you, if you haven't noticed, you have a lot of turkeys in the city. Um, so we glean all those pictures out. And then we break down those images so we only have deer photos. And what we have there, when you look at the branched antlered males, those are males that have more than spikes. And we can go through, and it's very tedious, trying to figure out how many individual males there are. Who's eight point, who's seven point, who's got a broken antler. And what we determined was, <clears throat> and then you figure out how many of those, how many adult females, and how many fawns we have. So we look at a ratio. So there's basically um, three quarters as many uh, females as adult males in photos and fawns as well with adult males. So if you look at your lower table, um, we identified 67 individual adult males in that study area, five individual spike males, um, so 72 total males. So that's just males. And so then we do that ratio, basically projecting that what's three quarters of 72, approximately. Uh, and you can see then you with that ratio based on the photos, you can determine how many adult females and how many fawns are out there. Um, and I put a little asterisk there with a minimum population estimate. Um, I, for those of you that don't know deer very well, um, there's very few areas, unless it's an enclosed area that's very protected, where there's either not poaching, a lot of deer vehicle collisions, um, there is very rarely as many adult males as adult females because they die at a higher rate. And all studies have shown that. Uh, they're not too smart. They disperse. They get hit by cars. They run into foreign environments. The mortality rates for males are higher. And in our previous year's work here uh, during culling efforts, we also were able to demonstrate that uh, there's a preponderance of females, actually. So looking at these data, I say this is a minimum because it's highly unlikely that you have more males. And that would represent about 42% of your population uh, would be male. So knowing that that's probably not accurate, and there's probably fewer males, because now you have males that in, we did this study in December, we put the cameras out in December, they just finished the breeding season. The males have probably lost 20 or 30% of their body weight in the last two months. They're hungry. They have antlers. So the females don't have a lot of say at the bait sites. So we often will get a bias towards images of males. So if you recalibrated those number of photos and say you had 30%, which is probably still on the high side um, of your population as adult males, you probably have closer to 80 deer per square mile, not 57. So just in that block of about three square miles, you probably at least have 250 deer, which brings you right back to where I was <laughs> in, in 2000 when I first showed up. Um, so, uh, and to put this in perspective, this is not unusual. So in a, in a study that was done uh, way back in the day, um, they had a 2,000, I mean, a, a two square mile fenced property uh, up in Michigan called the George Reserve. And one of the experiments, a basic experiment they did, they put seven deer in that facility. And it was all nice wooded areas and open fields, no predators, plenty of food. They went from seven to 232 in seven years. So the growth potential, these, your deer are getting hit by cars, there's coyotes, there's things that mitigate that rate of growth, but it's not a surprise if we went from 25 deer per square mile when we left back in 1999, I'm sorry, 
2009, 2010, until 10 years later to triple that population is, is not unrealistic. So what are your options? Um, uh, sadly, I've, I've been in this uh, discipline uh, for almost 30 years, um, and really nothing's changed. <laughs> It's, it's really kind of sad. Um, we've been uh, integral in, in developing controlled hunting, whether it's shotgun, archery. Uh, our sharpshooting methods have been the same for almost 20 years. Um, trap and euthanasia is still as limited as it's always been. Um, and again, with our fertility control technology, no one's really come up with vaccines that last a long time with a single injection. We don't have to recapture or re-administer those, those uh, agents. And in an area like yours where it's not going to be real easy, easy to get to those deer, you're not going to be able to use a vaccine that needs to be repeatedly administered. If you had really tame deer in a small area, vaccines are more practical. It's not practical in a community as large as yours. So, um, so the decision-making process today is literally no different than what it was in 1999 or back in 1996 when you first uh, were considering how to manage deer in your community. Um, so nothing's changed. So as I try to say, is don't overthink uh, your circumstance. Um, the one point to make, and there's the difference in, in uh, social acceptance of methods, right? Whether it's lethal or non-lethal, whether it's hunting versus, versus sharpshooting. Um, uh, things to, that are important to note is we have demonstrated that we can uh, effectively reduce deer just with fertility control agents. No one thought it could be done. Our publication that will be coming out this fall uh, will show otherwise. Um, but again, not, and I would not attempt it in an area, uh, the development patterns as, as you have here in Iowa City. Uh, sharpshooting, we've shown no restrictions. We can go to zero deer uh, if that were the choice. Uh, the challenge with bow hunting is um, we've published on this as well uh, four years ago, five, four or five years ago. Um, you just can't cull enough deer. So at that 57.5 deer per square mile, roughly on the low end, you can't even maintain that population with bow hunting uh, without the use of bait to attract animals. So just your recreational bow hunting, you can't reduce your local population. Uh, you might be able to maintain it, um, but you're out there with what we would call fairly primitive technology, um, and they don't have access, right? So you'd have to have very extensive access to private property. You have Hickory Hill Park. There's not a lot of public land uh, that would afford hunters to be able to cull enough deer to make a difference. Um, and, and there's literally nowhere in the country where anyone has shown archery hunting to get densities below uh, 45 deer per square mile using bait, uh, five month seasons, unlimited tags. So uh, it's a very uh, limited technology, um, good or bad. So where are you? So we're at the meeting tonight. So this is your social political exchange. Figure out really where the community wants to go. Um, think back through those options again. There's not a lot of new changes that have to be considered that have come forward, um, which is, again, a sad statement on my, on my profession. Um, th what the timeline is, time to meet your objectives, both near term of implementation and long term to, to see your population reductions. Um, what budget do you have available to meet those goals? Uh, and then ultimately, as, as Sue said, um, you know, you need, uh, permitting from the state agency that has the final authority uh, on how you manage uh, the natural resources, um, at least wildlife, in, in, your, in your city. Um, anyway, I'll leave it at that so you can uh, have a fair exchange with your fellow residents, and I'll be happy to answer questions once, uh, once you get through that session. Thank you, Tony. Um, we're going to get set up for the public comment aspect of this now. Tony will be back to answer questions, as we said. Um, Laura's going to set up here a computer and get some uh, a screen up on the on the board here that will have some questions that have already been submitted uh, that were submitted online. Uh, so you'll see some of those that are already already up and placed on the board. Um, when you come up to make your comment, if you have a question, certainly ask that question. Uh, Laura will make sure that it gets added to the list, and then we'll come back to that list um, when we've had a chance to, to, to go through public comment. Again, ask that you limit your, your comments to three minutes. Uh, we're going to try to hold to that. We have a lot of people here who may want to make comment. Uh, if you have 
uh, comment that's very similar to the person who just went, um, please make that known. And uh, if we can save that time for, for other people to speak, that would be great. Certainly want you to come up and make it known that you're in, in, in support of a person who just spoke. We want to have you do that, but we want to be cognizant of the fact that uh, we have limited amount of time, and then we'll come back and again answer those questions. There's probably a list of about 20 of them already. Uh, but your question will get added again. If you have the same question uh, as the person in front of you, please say that, so that way we know that that's a question that you want to have answered. And and we'll try to get those prioritized along those lines too. So having said that, if you want to make your way to the microphone, unlike a council meeting, you do not need to sign in. Um, if you want to tell us who you are, that's great. If you if you prefer to just make a comment, that's fine too. There's not uh, There are no rules surrounding that. So uh, having said that, please make your way to the microphone. My name is Dick Javes, and I live at 620 Northwood Drive. Um, I live on a property of over an acre and a third, which backs up to a ravine, and also it's next to Shimmick School, so there's a lot of open space in around that our area. Uh, we see a lot of deer. My biggest concern in watching the deer this year that have come through my yard is that the does seem to be much thinner and the fawns are small. This time of the year, the fawns usually are, are bigger than, than what we're observing right now. So I don't know whether, even though we've had a lush summer and spring where there's a lot to eat, especially in my yard, <clears throat> uh, I, I am concerned though what, the, what's, what might be happening with the herds. Thank you. I'm happy to um, hear that we have a forum that we can address this issue. In the, my name is Tony Wobiter, and I'm from the um, Bluffwood Circle area, which is just east of, of the Hickory Hill Park. And a, a year ago in July, I had been listening to other people experiencing a lot of complaints of their yards being decimated, their, their flowers. And <clears throat> so I decided to, to write up a petition. And the problems that were reported at that time uh, was a daily sight sighting of deer running through the neighborhoods, the sightings of seven bucks at one time in the neighborhood, two sightings and this was one of my experiences in 2016 of 17 deer in our backyard. And another neighbor also experienced that same issue. Um, other problems that have been addressed are vehicle collisions, um, inability of, of our neighbors to plant and harvest garden products without building a 12-foot wall. Um, in a, and also problems of devastation of our shrubberies and uh, other plants. The decimation of the flower beds in spite of the application also has been an issue of trying to fend off the deer with sprays, granular uh, repellents, and uh, to some extent that has been helpful, but when it rains, then you have to reapply, and so then you have to start over again. So I have a, um, <clears throat> a petition which over 50 people have signed. Not all in our neighborhood are you know, very much in agreement with this complaint that we do need to consider a reduction in the deer population. Um, I would be happy to submit this for, for further review with, with the photos of the deer that were cited. Unfortunately, I didn't have the opportunity to get my camera in time for the 17 deer that I saw in my backyard. But thank you for your willingness to address this issue, and I certainly welcome other people's experiences to share here tonight as well. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Allison Janes, and I'm a resident of Iowa City and a scientist at the university. And I wanted to bring up just a few points for everyone's consideration here. 
the first of which is the strategic vision that Iowa City has put forth includes, among other things, the sustainability clause and especially environmental sustainability. That means that we don't, we have a commitment not to throw away things that we find unacceptable and one use only and just get rid of them. And I think that this should extend to our natural world as well. Just because we don't like what's going on with the deer and we're having issues with our uh, plants, that does not mean that we should what they call in this, in this memorandum harvest, but really it's kill the deer to get rid of that problem. There are other things that can be done. A lot of people know that if you remove a pest from your house by whatever means that you do so, a lot of times what happens if you don't remove the attractant of whatever allowed that pest to come in, others are just gonna come right back in where that one had lived or, or, did, or caused damage before that. And that's not a long-term solution. So if you're every spring having to trap the squirrels to get them out of your attic, what you need to do is close the hole to your attic. And I don't see sharpshooting as closing that hole. I see it as a very temporary, um, very temporary Band-Aid on a long-term problem. And instead, I would like to know, I guess my question is, why has it not been a priority to find a long-term and non-lethal solution to the deer issue? That brings me to my last point, which is having somewhat recently moved from an area where we had a lot of issues with bears. Uh, what, what was done in that case with bear-human conflict is that we had to remove the attractant from our yards, from our neighborhoods, in order for those bears not to come to those areas. If we can educate people about removing the plants that the deers love to eat, harvesting fruit from your trees in a, in a timely manner in the fall so that deers are not attracted to those points, what we can do is start to limit that scope of where those deers move into to find their favorite foods and to be where they, where they find those delicious treats. And that's what we did with bears. It works very well. If we can do the same with deer, including potentially maybe a buyback program for landscaping so that we can start to replace some landscaping uh, with some uh, deer deterrence rather than what they like to eat. So I would say that your hostas are not really worth killing for, and we should try to make that a priority rather than bring up the sharpshooting. Thank you. We had a technological problem, but we are indeed writing down the question, so your question was included in that. It's just not going to appear on the screen there. Good, Joe. I'm Joe, Joe Coulter. Um, I live on <clears throat> Dubuque Street in the Stone House just before you get to to uh, Foster Road uh, and Bejaysville Lane. I own all of the property between Ridge Road and Dubuque Street and Bejaysville Lane. It's about two and a half acres. The deer for the last three years have been extremely aggressive and obnoxious. Uh, I came back uh, from a trip, I uh, was gone for a few weeks, and that not only cleaned out all of the hostas, uh, and many of the other flowering plants, but it even managed to eat the ivy off the wall uh, up to five feet. Um, I have noticed a, a number of deer accidents. The condition of the deer that are there, in part, I'm sure, because of the construction that's going on on Dubuque Street, uh, is very poor. There's a number of <coughs> lame uh, young very young deer that are lame uh, and, and uh, uh, hind legs. Uh, there's a number that have been hit by cars. Uh, there uh, have been, I don't know whether big buck last year was in having lots of problems. I don't know if it had been shot or what, but was definitely injured. Uh, so the overall health of this large number of deer is uh, very poor. And the only thing that I've been able to, to see as a potential solution uh, to the deer is 12-foot fences uh, around everything. And I don't think that's what we need to do. And I strongly support uh, the history and success that white buffalo have had in uh, mitigating our deer population. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Thank you. 
My name is Michael Conlon. I live in Shimmick One, that area that was up there on, on, off of uh, Northwood Drive. And I think a few deer are pretty, pretty interesting. But when you have a large population with no predators, I think you, you may have a problem. And how do you know you have too many? Well, when you look out, I live a, I have a relatively small front yard, middle of the afternoon, six deer just kind of grazing around out there. Go out in the morning, out your front door, and in this small front yard, you have three piles of deer crap, and for good measure, a fourth one five feet in front of your door on the sidewalk. Uh, I, I realize that certain plants they like, but they seem to like more and more. I had shrubs that were 15 years old. They're gone now. They've been gone the last two years. They've taken them. They didn't used to eat my uh, lilies. They eat them all now. Uh, they're, now they're starting to eat my uh, peonies. Uh, I, I also, uh, three times in the last three years, I've been bitten by deer ticks, uh, despite the fact that I wear uh, appropriate clothing and uh, use some repellent. So I, you know, I think it might be time to try to rein the number down a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I am um, a clinician scientist and I'm an uh, Iowa City resident. I'm a researcher, I'm knowledgeable in methodology, comparing methods between interventions. I'm an intervention development and I'm also comparing methods of, of interventions between uh, the um, interventions that I develop over the across the country and, and uh, in a couple of countries. And I have some questions regarding more about the, uh, the sharp shooting that you proposed, Dr. Nicola. Um, you gave an example about for Michigan, there was a two square mile of uh, the deer. There's a very subset population in here, and then it exploded essentially over a couple of years. And I'm wondering how that is different than what we're doing now, than a long-term solution, but then now what we're doing is that we are going to be killing a, a large amount of deer. How is that different on a larger scale? Um, are we going to be running into these problems again in 10 to 20 years? Um, so we do need a long-term solution, maybe slowly over time, and that is highly concerning to me, but then also I want to know what the cost effectiveness is between this methodology and other methods used, um, short and long term, including direct and indirect factors between the sharpshooting and then other methodologies that we have available for us. Um, and then also I would like to know as a researcher, I always have to disclose any conflicts of interest or any um, disclosures that I have with my research. And do you have any, in including industry sponsor, do you have any um, disclosures or COI conflicts of interest with um, your procedure that you're using, the research? and the dis dissemination of your results. So. Can I ask a clarifying question, just so we can follow up on your question later? Where you, you were asking about the two mile, and you were asking about how is that different. Can you restate that question for us Absolutely. Again? So it sounded like there was a previous study, and I've read most of your studies on, on your website, um, about how there was a, a, a smaller scale study where there's a few select deer in an enclosed population, and then over a few years it exploded. And now it seems like we're trying to do the same thing, but on a larger scale. How is that different? And how is that going to solve our problem in five or 10 years down the road? Because the idea that I have is that we're trying to get rid of a, a lot of deer now. Please let me know if I'm thinking this wrong. Um, if we're trying to get rid of a lot of deer now, it's going to be more opportunity for a reproduction of a mass amount of deer here shortly in the future. So that is my concern. And I think we're just going to be running down the same road again here very shortly. Thanks. And then how does that impact all the other populations that we have here? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Caroline Dieterle, um, I am not affected the same way that the people who have previously spoken because I live farther down toward the middle of town. And I have the luxury of being able to grow a very nice garden. And, you know, the people that I know who cannot grow anything, I feel very sorry for. Um, you know, people, someone was telling me just the other day that, that they can't even grow tomatoes. And, you know, most people or most animals think that tomatoes' foliage is toxic. They wouldn't go near it. And deer will even eat tomatoes. And you, um, what it really boils down to is, is that we have got a problem that we cannot fix in any other way but by removing some of the deer. That's just the way it is. 
And overpopulation of any animal leads to problems. You know, if we had rats all over the place, you know, they'd, people would be down here telling the council to, for God's sakes, do something about these rats. Or if we had loose dogs or cats or something like that. Animal control is something that nobody really likes to do. And people, too many people don't even like to think about the fact that when they eat meat, they're having to kill, you know, an animal. But that's the way it is. And um, I told the people on the Iowa Native Plants that this forum was on, and a couple of people replied to me privately and said they hoped that I would be sure to go and say something on behalf of the flora. Because well, there are too many plant, there are too many deer, you know, all of the native flora suffers too. And it isn't even just the people's gardens that go, but it's it's the wildflowers and you know the other things, and you you cannot um, and in the trees the sap the saplings. I mean, you if you can, you'll have a denuded landscape if you don't have uh, something done. And the other thing is, is is that any any animal in our the way the world works ecologically, if there's no predation, which essentially is the case with the deer. Um, populations get out of control. And that's the, what happens when we mess with things by interfering. We don't have coyotes running loose, and we don't have foxes and, you know, other things that prey on deer. So we have a problem, and we really have got to do something, because you have to remember, in the, to reply to the lady who was talking about sustainability, you know, we're, been, we're being exhorted to grow our own vegetables and to become more self-sufficient, and local food is a big deal. Well, you can't do that very well if, you know, overnight some animal is going to come in and eat your entire row of beans and all of your tomato. It just it doesn't compute. So it's a matter of competition, and I'm afraid that I, I'm squarely in, in favor of some, some, something being done. I don't like to kill animals either, but on the other hand, sometimes you have to do it. It's just a matter of the way life works. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Preston Moore. I am no longer an Iowa City resident, unfortunately, but I am currently the state director for the Humane Society of the United States. Full disclosure, we have partnered with White Buffalo for some of the studies that were referenced. Um, and so I'll preface what I'm going to say with uh, our first preference, of course, is non-lethal uh, control um, in, in any circumstance. However, um, if lethal control is going to be implemented, the method that's being described in terms of being done by a sharpshooter is without question the most humane way of doing it. Um, like I said, our first preference, of course, is non-lethal mitigation. But if it's going to be done, we would rather see it be done by sharpshooters than what a lot of smaller communities do with bow and arrows. I mean, you, you referenced it a little bit already. It's not as effective. Um, we sure appreciate you bringing that up. We do, however, want to urge this committee and the council at large to consider this as part of a uh, more comprehensive conflict mitigation plan, not necessarily just a never-ending uh, pattern of a, a call and then stopping for a decade or who knows how long and then restarting, because then when it comes down to it, you have forums like this where people are upset on both sides, and uh, it's just starting a vicious cycle. And so I think if anyone would appreciate this, it's Iowa City residents. I have a 40-page document that I did not print out for all of you. Um, I saved some trees there, but I would be happy to send it along. Um, it's still in draft form, but I've been given permission to share it. It's the outlines of how communities can develop deer conflict mitigation plans on a comprehensive level. Liz, I know I have your email. I could send you a copy and you could distribute it. Um, if anyone else has questions on that, I could also connect you to our Urban Wildlife Conflict Department, uh, and they can answer more questions. Um, but I appreciate your time, and I, I know that we, as an organization, appreciate uh, the opportunity for the citizens here to, to come to a forum like this and voice their concerns. Thank you. Please send that to Liz. Of course. Uh, briefly, can you explain um, how something becomes more or the most humane, like 
Just wondering if that's in your opinion or if there's a way to determine that. How sharp shooting would be the most humane? Is that your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, you know, if you take, for example, trapping and uh, chemical euthanasia, that causes a great deal of stress on the animal in the interim. Um, it's not necessarily always, uh, you know, a tranquilizer dart and euthanasia on the spot, that sort of thing. Um, the bow and arrow, you know, I kind of already preference or uh, mentioned there. It. Uh, <laughs> isn't always instant, uh, whereas sharpshooting is fairly, fairly quick. Um, you know, poisons, of course, aren't humane. Um, I don't recall the other methods that were up on the screen. But does that answer your question? I think it's, it's really in terms of the speed uh, of the cull that's being done. Um, they're able to really target quickly uh, the numbers in the population. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gerald Kenneman, and uh, I've been a resident of uh, Bluffwood Circle for 15 years and uh, have yet to observe a deer automobile accident. We look at these matters from different perspectives, and obviously the people have addressed serious issues that concerns how we deal with it. This particular uh, group has said that they consider the number of deer vehicle accidents, the number of resident-generated calls, and the number of deer. Uh, the first speaker indicated that there had been an increase in deer vehicular incidents, which is not necessarily correct. They have were 33 such incidents when the initial program was finished in the year 2009. Uh, there were uh, 30, 32, 34, 51 in 2016, and I believe 34 so far through November of 2017 for an average of about a little over 36 incidents. In uh, 2009, there were no injuries. No injuries are reported in the memo which the city has provided. Most of the incidents occurred apparently on the highway and not uh, in the neighborhoods. There's also the matter of the calls that the city has received, which they consider, and the nine calls regarding plants in 2016 and six in 2017 are hardly a basis for action by this committee. But again, uh, we approach this based on our own experience. The other factor is the number of deer, which has been addressed. The White Buffalo has tried to provide an estimate on which we can rely. It is acknowledged that the photographic examination which it conducted uh, was not, in its view, accurate, but it indicated that there were 172 deer as opposed to um, the uh, 250 or 80 that might be extrapolated uh, using uh, comparisons or models which may or may not be applicable. So the question is, how many deer can we actually accommodate without killing them? Because eliminating some deer will not resolve the problems of some of these landowners of which I am one, have been experiencing. So it seems to me that we're here tonight to determine what uh, expenditures, of any, the city council is willing to make to um, save the plants of the homeowners, uh, unless there is a compelling uh, basis for uh, concern of safety. It seems to me that the interaction between deer and homeowners is best served by their action, unless, of course, the city were to undertake to support them in some way to compensate them or provide them with instruction and help in setting across uh, their particular residences uh, plants which would not be so attractive. And I might say for my friends here that a spray and which I have no interest as a company, entitled R3, has been particularly effective for me in the last two years in saving hostas that have been consistently munched over the years. So although I think that uh, landowners, particularly those who have purchased residences 
near areas which are conduits for deer. And living near Hickory Hill on the side of the creek is certainly one of those. Um, have faced and need to face this problem individually. And if the city is to provide assistance, I'd rather that we exercise some uh, humility in our choice of action. Because even though we are a species that has the power to destroy deer, I'd like to see us take steps to try to maintain a sustainable population before we decide to kill deer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Susan Craig. I live on North 7th Avenue. My property backs up to Hickory Hill Park. I've lived there for 30 years. I enjoy the deer. I think there should be deer, but it is out of balance. Some of the deer need, the last two years, of 30 years, the last two years, more deer traffic in my yard across the road. Um, two weeks ago, I looked out the front door. There was a mother nursing her fawn in the middle of the street. Um, it, there are just, it's time to go back to what we did before. I have no problem with sharp shooting. I don't mind using the word kill or harvest. I understand that last time the, the meat was harvested and given to the food pantry, which I think is a good option. Um, there are many people in this state that rely on venison as a protein source in the wintertime. Um, you know, I have hunters in my family. I don't have a problem with killing deer, and there are just too many of them. The only time I have called 911 in 30 years is because of a dead, not dead, dying deer flopping around on Rochester. It's not a safe thing. I, you know, you can talk about deer accidents, but it's really scary when five of them go running across a very busy road like Rochester. Thank you. My name is Lynn Gallagher. I, I just think that non-lethal options should be explored before you decide to go to lethal options. And I went to the March 6th meeting, the work session of the city council, and I was really disappointed that it was the first time they discussed it and they went right to sharpshooting. They didn't even talk about non-lethal methods. I think it's really disappointing that they have to have the state, was it the NCR, N NRC. CRS? NRC? had to tell them to have a public forum. Why the heck didn't they do it on their own? I mean, why didn't they listen to the residents on their own instead of being told they had to? Um, I just think we need to explore non-lethal options. And, you know, it, if it's a public safety issue, that's one thing. If, if it's deer eating your hostas, that's another. I have friends that live in Iowa City. They have a huge garden. They put up a deer fence. They have no issues, obviously. They put up a fence. And I think we need to coexist with wildlife. So I just think we need to, to consider that and not just decide, well, they're eating this and that, and, and I don't like it, so let's get rid of them. Even if you call them, even if you reduce the numbers, there's still going to be some deer, and they could still come eat your plants. So please, please explore non-lethal options before you just go to the sharpshooting. And by the way, bow hunting, they die a slow death. The bow hunters often are not accurate. I mean, you ought to read about it. Just Google it and read about it online, because it's awful. So I do really appreciate that if you're going to do a lethal method, that you're going to use sharpshooting. Because if you're going to do that, that's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Carl Klaus. Uh, I live on Reno Street. Uh, a few uh, houses away from Reno Street Park where uh, 12 deer uh, come down through Reno Street Park and across the front lawns of the houses next to me. Uh, and there are 12 or 15 in my yard almost every day when they are not uh, spawning. Uh, and uh, I have lived in this house for 48 years. And when I first moved into the house, I longed to see a deer. 
and my wife Kate, no longer alive, longed to see a deer, and we had to wait three winters before we saw one, and we were elated at the vision of it, and we hoped we would see a few more. And as you know, um, our wishes were fulfilled <laughs> beyond uh, our wildest nightmares. Now, in the interests of, of curbing the deer, um, I have had built seven foot fences around both of my vegetable gardens. Uh, I have used hinder regularly. I have installed ultrasonic uh, uh, machines, but none of these methods work. Uh, now, I used to think that uh, shooting the deer would solve the problem until I noticed that over the course of the years that the sharpshooting program was in operation, we still had a large deer count. And so in, in a sense, what it's telling us is that sharpshooting isn't enough or isn't the way to solve this problem. Um, I've lived in Iowa City for 62 years. And one of the things that I noticed when I first moved to town was that there was very, very little development outside of town in the countryside. But over the years of my life here, it's been difficult to ignore how many developments, neighborhoods and exurbs and whatever you wish to call them, have developed in the surrounding countryside. And as those developments have been built in the uh, surrounding countryside, the deer have lost the natural place where they lived before. So they have, they have in effect been displaced. They've been moved from the countryside into the city. And I think that in order to deal with this problem, sharpshooting will not be as effective as sterilization because one has to do everything possible to reduce the perpetuation of the population and the expansion of the population. In other words, I'm talking about ZPG. And I don't think ZPG can be achieved, zero population growth, by shooting them. Uh, a much more effective and rational way is, it seems to me, to sterilize as much as possible in order to reduce that population because it's multiplied uh, within the city and all around us. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. I'd like to address the suggestion that don't plant hostas, plant something else. I have a yard that's full of hostas. I live where it's very hilly uh, over by Hickory Hill, and I have nothing but stems, hundreds and hundreds of hostas and nothing but stems. And somebody suggested earlier that they'll eat, they're eating bushes. I have huge hydrangea bushes that are normally, uh, in the past have been by this time six feet tall. They're, they're this, hall, this tall now. Um, I was a long time uh, Johnson County Master Gardener, so I've taken the classes about what to plant. I've talked to the local plant stores about what to plant. And what people will eventually say to you is if the deer are hungry enough, they'll eat anything. I have rose bushes. Rose bushes have thorns. They're eating the rose bushes. So the suggestion that it's easy to find an alternative to hostas or the things that the deer like uh, is questionable. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a quick question. Um, sure. I, I'm sorry. I should have I should have asked it during my time. I'm wondering whether they have ever thought about putting an abortifacient uh, into salt blocks or 
um, some sort of um, hormonal uh, preparation, estrogen on the deer level, that would be uh, disruptive at the uh, volume that they would have if they had unlimited access to the salt lick, and that that would be maybe a way to sterilize them. Thank you. My name is Linda Ostegard. I live in the Shumik area. Actually, my home backs on Dubuque and goes up to Ridge. We have lots more deer than we had before. I think we're at the same level we had when we did the initial calling. I'd like to point out that I have a lot of hostas. I have a lot of other things. Um, as a person who just came up, spoke, they really will eat absolutely everything. I spray at least once, if not twice a week, to try to get them to avoid my plants. It doesn't work. But I'm not so much worried about my plants. I realize I put them out there for my pleasure. I enjoy it. But I have a lot of woods around me. There is no undergrowth left here anymore. And when we moved there 35 years ago, there was a lot. But the deer are eating everything. So we're not just losing what we're planting in our yards as gardeners, we're losing that flora and the fauna that are in the, the surrounding area that we have. And I don't know what happens to the, the woods or the tree-like area that we have there, but the deer are destroying that as well. So I think that's another thing that we should consider, along with the fact that my husband hit a deer in our driveway driving out. So he didn't actually hit the deer. He avoided it, but he did cause a lot of damage to his pickup truck. And finally, I've been treated for Lyme disease twice in the last five years. So I have sort of a personal dislike of the deer for that reason as well. Thank you. John Brandon, I live on Brown Street, and we've got a ravine up behind us. The deer just come right through. And I don't think this problem will ever be resolved because I'm all in favor of culling the deer herd, but the one other thing's attractive about being in Iowa City, if you're a deer, is that there's no one hunting you. You're out in the country, someone is hunting you if you're a deer. The town is a safe place for them, so please call the deer. Thank you. I'm Kathy Wilcox, and I live on Taft Speedway, and um, I walk every morning and have been really surprised at the number of deer that I will see, and I only walk from Taft Speedway, Dubuque Street, Foster Road, and No Name. And um, one morning, I counted nine deer, not all in the same place. I also saw on the Friday of Rye Bride, coming out of Joe Coulter's area, there was um, a mother and three fawn that were making it across Dubuque Street, and the city workers were there, and I was standing there, and we said, oh no, you know, either come across or stop. Fortunately, the cars stopped. Um, but this was early in the morning, and what I'm concerned about is, once Dubuque Street reopens, the volume of traffic coming down there is gonna be hazardous for everybody. And I have plants, they've been eating it, I agree with everybody else that for those that agree that something needs to be done. And so I'm all in favor of having something be done. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Mark, uh, Mark Finley, Iowa City resident here. Um, I am in favor of the bow hunting option, uh, like a lot of the other cities in Iowa have done. I'm probably the oddball in the room, I guess. Uh, but just Going through the numbers and things like that, I know uh, Corville has killed approximately a thousand deer with their bow hunting system over the years. Um, with bite white buffalo, I think they've killed around 2,000 over the years. Uh, that's with baiting and shooting at night, um, you know, which are both not legal in Iowa. Um, I have actually seen um, video of one of your hunts. Uh, it's been about 10 years ago. One of my buddies was uh, videoing in the house next door. And to say it's more humane or more uh, uh, quick to shoot him in the head, uh, yeah, the first one is. But as the deer scatter when you shoot, you know, they're getting shot in other places. And I've seen that on video, uh, like I say, from a, from a house next door, um, deer crawling, you know, to their death, basically. So um, to say bow hunting is not uh, a lethal way to do it, uh, a lethal shot's a lethal shot, uh, depending on what method you choose, I guess. 
but just my opinion, I guess. Thank you. I have a question of the attorney. Uh, is the city liable for the health risk of the deers? Okay, we'll, well, we'll, they, they we'll add that. To the potential health risk, and I wonder if the city conceives of itself as being, uh, in some sense, legal re legally responsible for that. Okay, we'll, we'll add that to the list of questions that we'll come back to. But to clarify, you said, is the city liable for the health risk of the deer? Are you speaking about the health risk to people or the health risk to deer? Health risks to people. To people. Hello, I'm a long-term resident of Iowa City and I've always been proud to hail from this great community. We have long prided ourselves in our open-mindedness, creativity, valuing our, of education, diversity of all types, progressiveness and our ability to rationally problem solve, explore options and think outside the box. Being here tonight to discuss the slaughter of nonviolent sentient beings is not, in my opinion, Iowa City's finest moment. I sincerely hope that we can come to our senses and arrive at a non-lethal solution to this disagreement that applies the values that make us proud to reside in this community. It seems readily apparent that some are leaping to a conclusion that managing the deer population in this community by killing animals without even considering or discussing the possibility of non-lethal alternatives is a deeply flawed approach. When UI students hold rowdy late night parties, we don't shoot the students, no. We discuss and pass ordinances that make the landlords who rent to these students accountable and responsible. When dogs run loose or defecate in people's yards, we don't kill the dogs. We examine the issue and pass leash laws and pooper scooper ordinances. There are valid scientific alternatives to killing deer that have been proven in other communities and that we have ready and ample resources in Iowa to provide. There's been talk of spending of the city spending between $65,000 and $90,000 for this call that will be at best a short-term remedy. Education is a very core value of this community. We have numerous resources available to educate property owners who made the choice to live in some of the most beautiful green and wooded areas of our city about how to live compatibly with wildlife. There are several well-respected wildlife rehabilitators in this state available to present this information. We have an active backyard abundance group in town with extensive knowledge about native plants that would not attract deer. Iowa has a number of resources, Seed Savers, Prairie Moon, Prairie Nursery, Ion Exchange, as well as local nurseries that carry native plants. There are numerous national groups that can also provide us support. Education is a basic starting place, beneficial to all, and certainly less costly in a variety of ways than killing animals for the sake of landscaping. There are also a number of low cost and effective deterrents and repellents, as well as strategic fencing and netting options. Along with or education could go thoughtful ordinances restricting feeding of deer and other things that attract them. Although I do not live directly in the Bluffwood area, I do live in that part of town. I personally know several people do, who do and I frequently visit there. I have never seen a car accident in that area. While not the most affluent neighborhood in town, the homes are bordered by a lovely creek and a gorgeous wooded area. The people who reside there surely should have not be surprised that deer are abundant in that area, especially due to the proximity of Hickory Hill Park. People have choices, the deer do not. We have continued to encroach on their habitat, as someone else here mentioned. First constructing the First Avenue extension that cuts across Hickory Hill Park, now allowing increasing construction among the remaining areas of green space. Perhaps it is time for us as Iowa Citians to really think outside the box and consider preserving and expanding native habitats, green space, pollinator gardens, and similar wildlife friendly spaces so that we can continue to protect our beautiful state and our beautiful city and the plants and animals that inhabited it long before we came along. Thank you everyone for your comments and your time. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Barb Gartner, and unfortunately, I am one of those Rochester people. But so we have a lot of deer traffic. <laughs> but my question is kind of: in has is there studies about what you know, like Hickory Hill Park? What the amount of you know acreage that we have there? What how? How much uh, deer can, can actively live comfortably in that park? You know. Kind of. Thank you. My name is Kevin Kelly. I'm a tree farmer. I don't live in Iowa City, um, but um, a, a couple things that nobody's mentioned about deer is how much they eat every day. Uh, the average deer eats about seven pounds of material a day. Um, according, that's according to the Iowa DNR. Um, Iowa State has said that the deer will eat over 350 different species of plant material in the state of Iowa, which is everything that I know of. I don't know of anything they won't eat. Um, they will eat everything. Um, we have the third largest um, number of deer crashes in the United States. Um, versus Iowa. Um, we never know how many deer crashes there are because it's not a reported thing in Iowa. It's all a guesstimate. It's probably a lot higher than what it is. Um, the deer, um, since I'm a tree farmer, we see the destruction of our woodlands. When, the, when our understory is all destroyed, we have no new trees coming, and it's going to take a while. A hundred years from now, we're going to look back and say, why did we not control these animals when we had the chance? Because um, we have no new trees coming. Go out into your woodlands. There's no new trees coming. The deer are eating them all off. Um, they, um, <clears throat> the recommended number, actually, for, the, for deer in woodlands is seven deer per square mile. Now, we're talking 50-some deer that they're finding right now. Um, that number is so high um, that it just has to be reduced. Um, we do it out in the country. I mean, I use my right to protect my property. I ended up shooting 48 deer myself last year on my own property, simply to be able to stay in business and be a tree farmer. So shooting does work. It keeps the numbers down. It reduces your Lyme disease. They've shown that low numbers of deer have low numbers of Lyme disease. Um, many studies have shown this. And so if you've got a lot of deer, you know, would you want your kids out there, your grandkids out there walking around in the yard? You know, Lyme disease is a serious thing. And ask anybody who's had it and didn't know it for several years. It's a, it's a terrible disease. So um, they need to be reduced. Um, to be effective. Um, sure, we all like a few deer. Um, the state of Iowa owns 350,000 acres, um, and they can have all the deer they want on their property, I always say. Um, if I don't want any deer on my property, I don't feel I have to put up a fence, and I don't. I remove them. But if you like the deer, like I tell people, put up a fence and put some deer in there and see how much you like them then. <laughs> but that's all I have to say, and it's nice to be down here and be able to express our thoughts about deer. I have no love for him. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. My name, excuse me, my name is Ann Ford. I live on Forest Glen, which is where Whiting and Ridge Road come together. So I'm at the top of a 40-acre ravine, a forest preserve, and uh, I see a lot of deer. Uh, we moved there in um, 1998 and that there were just stems on a few things. The, after the, the deer hunt, the, the culling of the deer a couple of years later, we had a huge resurgence of landscaping in our yard. It was wonderful. Daylilies and hostas that had been really, that somehow survived. Um, but in the meantime, you know, it's been a long time since they've done that culling and there's been a huge growth. My father said, he went to university here in, in the late 30s and said that there, they didn't see deer. That deer, I don't know, this is anecdotal, that were, they were reintroduced to Iowa because people thought that would be a lovely thing to have around. And, and, uh, but in the 1950s when I was growing up here, I did not see deer ever. Um, I think that calling them is appropriate, and I also think that it should be not just a one-time thing. I think when it was being done more routinely, 
over, you know, in a planned way, but it, it kept the population more reasonable. But, but we're talking about once, doing this once, but I think it should be something that's done every few years to keep the population reasonable and under control. And I'm afraid to go into the woods now with the ticks, with the deer ticks out there and, and the high incidence of Lyme disease in our community. I'd, I'd love to have it back. We used to enjoy walking in the woods a lot more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have been a longtime outdoorsman, hunter, fisherman. Um, part of our license fees every year goes to the Hush Fund, which is used to process deer that are brought in and donated. I would like to see at least some consideration towards the bow hunters and not just a one year thing. If we could do it year after year, I think that you could possibly control the population a little better than a one time hunt, which definitely is more effective for a one year. But then, you know, the numbers start to creep back up. And I personally am willing to buy tags so it doesn't cost the city. I'm curious what the average cost is per deer that's harvested on a pay program. I guess I would like to see people that have land that is being decimated by all the deer. I'd like to see them maybe be on a list that we could say, okay, these are people that have too many deer on their property. It would be nice if we could have, sorry, it'd be nice if we could have some of the deer taken off of our property. Deer do move around quite a bit, so it's not going to be, you know, 12 deer from somebody's property isn't going to solve their problem. But, you know, I've participated in Coralville's urban hunting program. I've been hunting since I was young. And the truth is that not everybody is going to enjoy, you know, harvesting of animals. I, it's not, you can't make everyone happy, but, you know, if you have if you have too many deer, you need to do something with them. I would like to see at least for a year or two, let's see if we could control it without paying for it. Seems like right now, I know we've already got white buffalo on board counting the deer, which is a good idea for a, a basis of where we stand, but it seems like when you say the only place that we can hunt is Hickory Hill, and I know that a lot of people like that as a recreational spot, and they're not going to enjoy hunters being there necessarily. You know, we need to have more people that own property say, I would be willing to have people come on my property, and then, you know, maybe we can control some of the numbers that way. I would pay to do it. You know, I prefer to harvest my own meat that I eat. You know, I mean, every, you know, everyone has their own opinion, but I think that we should at least consider the option of bow hunting. So, thank you. Thank you. Since everybody has spoken to their experience with deer, I thought I would I would do as well. Um, I haven't had the same experience with deer as others have in their yard. I live on Reno Street, very close to Carl, and um, deer are certainly in my yard. They haven't bothered t the tomatoes um, in front of my front porch. Um, they certainly are in the backyard, and they've they've eaten things. It's not a problem because they haven't eaten all the little trees that I planted a couple years ago. So I really enjoy the deer. Um, I uh, clearly am in the minority. It seems a foregone conclusion that we'll, we will probably have a deer kill this year, and, and I consider that unfortunate. I actually thought I was seeing more deer because I was becoming a quieter walker through my neighborhood or something. 
Um, apparently not. So I, I would just like to say that I would like to echo some of the things that people have said about it adds to a quality of life that I enjoy here. I moved to Goosetown because I wanted to be closer to Hickory Hill Park. I wanted to be closer to the cemetery. I wanted to be closer to those natural experiences. I walk every morning. I get to see deer. I consider it a very, very good day when I um, ride my bike through there. You know, it's it's just a delight. Granted, they they come very close, but it's 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 really a nice experience for me, and it adds to um, kind of the magic of living in Iowa City. So it would be. Um, I understand people's concerns, certainly. And I have some hostas that you might want to try because they don't seem to touch them at all, and I don't know what it is about them. Um, but I, I'm not sure that we're ready for this. I think that we should look at some non-lethal methods. Um, the, the council really did jump in and send a letter right away without public comment this spring, and I think um, perhaps um, let's spend a, a little bit more another season and look at it and see what we can come up with. Question for you, um, a very odd thing. I heard about deer vasectomies. Is that really a thing? Um, <laughs> I, so, I mean, I think we should be considering some non-lethal methods because we need a long-term solution to, to achieve the balance for people like me who like them and for people who like Susan who are very frustrated with them. Thank you. Marge Hoppen, I'm from Manville Heights. I think the neighborhood should be represented here tonight because uh, I have neighbors surrounding my home who would be happy to have uh, white buffalo come in. And um, if you want to ask us for some money to do it, we'd be glad to do that too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I started this thing yeah. off, and my concern was the health of the deer. And I'm still concerned with it, and I think it's because we have an overpopulation of deer in our city limits that um, they have no predators. So I think we have to take that role. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've seen a decline in the health of the deer that come through my yard, and I have lots of them. I have fences around my vegetable gardens. I have planted things that I thought they wouldn't eat two years ago. They didn't. This year they are. But I, it, we just, the population of the deer in town is to the point where I think we also have to think for, uh, about the health of the deer. And if that goes downhill, we're going to have a bigger problem than we have just eating hostas or geraniums. They haven't eaten the marigolds yet, but hey, we're getting there. Okay. Thank you. But I think that's a consideration we need. Thank you. Hi. Um, I live about three blocks from Hickory Hill, and every other day or so, I see a few deer walk by our house. One deer was a large buck, and he had a large cyst on his leg, likely from disease or an injury. And so I think that that shows that one way or another, deer are going to die. And often, it's it naturally, it's going to be more, more brutal than hunters, I think, because disease can take months. Being hit by a car is often very brutal, and being torn apart by a coyote is, is pretty brutal. And I think that perhaps if white buffalo came in for one year and lowered the population, that bow hunters from then on could at least manage that population from there. And I think that would be a more effective solution. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, my name is Dan McGee. I live in the uh, Bluffwood neighborhood, my, my wife, Claudia. Uh, one thing I just wanted to ask is really uh, to consider a very long-term solution. Clearly, there are some short-term issues that have to be uh, conducted. But in terms of taking a look at how we manage that population in the future is going to be critical. And I'd really like to uh, have, uh, the main question I have is, I'd like to see a broader scientific analysis of birth control, which is your expertise. But we have this great land grant 
plant, vet school, uh, just 130 miles from here. I'd like to get some experts in animal, uh, uh, contemporary animal uh, birth control to talk to the council, to this panel, because human birth control technology has changed vastly in the last 10 years. And so I'd really like to see us go beyond just hiring individual consultants to perhaps doing a broader literature review, because right now your literature really covers population estimation, uh, and I believe you that, that you're an expert in this area, but as a scientist myself, I want people to beat up my data, uh, and it takes a lot of people uh, to beat up data. So I'd, I'd really like to get other uh, views of population uh, technology, birth control t technology to be uh, considered. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Lori Crawford. I want to know since that guy got to speak twice, do I get six minutes? <laughs> okay. Um, I, uh, I was on the Deer Task Force in Cedar Rapids in 1997 and again in 2004 and 2005. Um, the 1997 task force decided to go with non-lethal methods, and there are a number of them that address both deer vehicle accidents and browse. And from what I can tell, nothing has been implemented in Iowa City. Um, somebody else mentioned education, public education regarding plantings, um, regarding where you're apt to encounter deer, and the fact that if you see one, you're going to see more. Um, we talked about signage, putting up um, deer crossing signs. Reflectors worked on Highway 1 when Highway 1 bisected the eating and sleeping areas of the deer. The reflectors were 100% um, successful in reducing deer vehicle accidents. There is sterilization that somebody mentioned. There's birth control. There is, there is birth control, like where they can lick a salt block or something like that. I understand that's available. Um, one thing that I'd really like to see us look at is overpasses and underpasses, wildlife crossings. Um, at least 25 states in the United States have implemented those as ways to reduce deer vehicle accidents. Nothing's been mentioned about that. I just think there are so many things that haven't been addressed that are non-lethal ways. Um, Tony said that um, nothing has changed despite shooting and killing deer, and that's true. And so he himself said it twice during his talk, and I think that we need to look at that and look at ways to learn to coexist. Uh, the person who mentioned, several people mentioned deer ticks. Um, they don't travel on the deer, they travel on mice. And so the deer have been, um, Victimized, or not victimized, but I can't think of the word I want, but uh, the, the, thank you. What was it? Scapegoating. Scapegoating, thank you. <laughs> um, also, I live, um, I have eight acres behind my house. I moved to Iowa City two years ago, and uh, I have undergrowth, so I haven't seen that problem there. Um, I'd like to speak briefly to sharpshooting versus bow hunting. I, I, first, I'd like to say I'm opposed to any killing. I, I think there are a lot of other ways to address this. I'm willing to help um, as an advisor or just share information that we developed and learned about when I was on the task force. We had lots of speakers come in. But I, um, I bow hunting is a problem. Uh, we did bow hunting in Cedar Rapids, and I know there's a bow hunter on the committee, Mr. Mildenstein. Um, uh, I have personal incidents, personal experiences with bow hunting. Uh, there's a vital area that's 12 inches where the heart and lungs are, and the deer has to be shot there to die instantly. And I had one deer that took 10 months to die, uh, coming and going from my yard. And when he finally did die, I had a necropsy done, and he had a, an arrow in him, an unsterilized arrow that had caused an infection and killed him. I had that happen to another buck in my yard also. Um, the Cedar Rapids bow hunt did not have, um, they had lax rules, and there were a lot of people hunting illegally. So I, I strongly object to bow hunting. If we are going to kill, I'd prefer to see sharpshooting. Um, but I really agree with all the people who are saying, let's slow down. What's another year at this point, and let's look at non-lethal methods and, and try to come up with some things that might work for everybody. Um, the killing uh, doesn't work. You're, you're still going to have deer eating tulips and hostas, and you're still going to have deer crossing roads. So killing one deer, killing 300 deer, isn't going to take care of the problems that people have been raising here today. 
I do have a couple questions for you, Tony. Um, sterilization, I'm really in favor of that, and I, if you could speak to that a little bit. Um, I also understand that you do shoot deer in, in the head. I've read that in your, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think I read that in your materials. Now, that's not a vital area, so I'm, I'm curious as to why you've chosen the head as the uh, target. Uh, also, it said that sometimes you use a vehicle and sometimes you use a bait station, and I wanted to know if, if that, if you still do that. My understanding was that you would shoot them at a bait station and then net them, and maybe I'm wrong about that. That was from a, a long time ago. Um, so anyway, those are my questions, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. We're going to cut the public comment here in five minutes, so if, uh, if you have something, you should make your way up to the, to the podium now. Hi, my name is Dawn. Um, I'm a resident of Northside, Iowa City. I live very close to Hickory Hill Park. Um, for the record, I have deer in my yard quite frequently, and they've devoured my hostas and my tulips. Um, I really don't mind because I enjoy the deer far more than I enjoy my hostas, to be honest. Um, I did have a couple questions for Dr. DiNicola. Um, I'm curious, um, you'd mentioned that you've um, attempted sterilization efforts before, but they were unsuccessful, and I was curious, um, is, that, is that correct? Oh, okay. Um, well, I was curious if that was true, um, why it was not effective. Um, and my other question is, um, what kind of ammo is used for sharpshooting? Um, as I've, I'm a wildlife educator, I've been in this field for several years, and we often educate about the fact that lead is um, toxic to far more than just the animal that is shot with it. It, it um, excuse me, um, can decimate um, far more than, than just the one animal. Um, so I would like to hear that addressed. And um, I, I echo many of the, the sentiments that other people have shared. Um, I am strongly in favor of nonviolent um, means of wildlife management. Um, I think that Iowa City is a very progressive community, and I think that that we can take this opportunity to to prove that, to prove our um, our progressive qualities by exploring other nonviolent um, long-term means of wildlife management, such as sterilization, wildlife contraceptives. Um, I also think that um, immediately jumping to um, Jumping to a, a, a violent means of wildlife management um, speaks to a deeper problem of um, humans seeking to um, control and destroy nature on a large scale. Um, and so I think that we can take this opportunity to uh, provide education and teach respect for the environment and for nature and um, discover ways that we can all coexist peacefully. Um, and I'd also like to mention that I did bring with me a petition tonight that is in support of nonviolent means of wildlife management. Um, for those who might be interested in signing it, um, I'll be available after, after the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we'll... Uh We'll start with the, the question and answer part of this now, and we're going to try to go through these, not necessarily in the order that we have them posted here, but perhaps more um, try to shoot some things over to Tony here that will be some factual questions that he, maybe he can go through and, and, and walk us through and then uh, maybe work to things that uh, were more popular questions or more general themes. Um, so we won't necessarily go down the, the list in this order, but Laura can kind of walk us through that. Yeah, so I apologize again that we weren't able to get these up. These were actually questions that Jan had provided that had come up in the previous task force meetings, I believe, right, Jan? Yeah. Um, so I, th I uh, took care of getting all the questions down that came up tonight that we asked you to hold until now. And like I said, I thought, or as Bill said, I thought we would go to qu sort of questions that many people had questions for Tony, um, some of them sort of yes or no questions or asking, you know, why you you do certain processes. Um, so I, I have a list for you. So rather than just listing them off altogether, I'll go one by one. So uh, what is the average cost per deer when we use white buffalo? Would you prefer that I stay here or go to the podium? I think there's fine. Okay. Um, 
typically it ranges anywhere from 200 to 450 dollars a deer at this stage but it depends on what methods um, you're using so if you have a more uh, vehicle accessible environment uh, like the peninsula used to be uh, you can be highly efficient uh, when you have to work over select bait sites and individual properties um, the labor and effort per deer increases which brings you to the higher level of that cost spectrum so that's a good segue into the, another question. I think you just had um, the, where you stated sometimes you use a vehicle, sometimes you use bait stations. Which one, when, and why the difference? Right, so we almost always use bait. It's just you may um, approach that baited location with a vehicle. Um, so back on uh, ACT's property, for example, um, before the cut through <laughs> happened, which changes things substantially, but um, uh, and the peninsula. but. In private properties, you may be in an elevated tree stand uh, on a deck behind someone's house that gives you a safe angle of trajectory over a baited location. So it just depends on um, where we need and how we need to access animals in the, in the environment. Uh, why does white buffalo shoot deer in the head? Um, it is an AVMA um, approved method of euthanasia. So whether you have an animal that's injured on the side of the road, as law enforcement should be trained to euthanize, uh, it is considered an immediate and instantaneous death. Uh, so that's our, our protocol uh, associated with euthanizing animals. We're just uh, submitting a publication, uh, hopefully next week, if I can get the figures done. Um, we'll also do some analysis looking at um, relative degrees of euthanasia, which is uh, uh, what was determined to be a good death. So when you're slaughtering animals, domestic animals, um, what are those procedures? Both behavioral exposure to stress as well as the immediacy to what's called insentience. You know, once they're no longer aware of the situation until they have lost uh, both respiratory and, and cardiac function. Um, so we also look at shot placement on the various placements on the cervical spine um, when we're trying to euthanize the animals from a distance. So we're, we're very very acutely aware of all technologies, methodologies. Uh, I'm on the AVMA uh, depopulation panel, um, so I design and develop uh, protocols for how to um, euthanize animals in large-scale emergencies, for example. Um, they come to me to help determine what protocols might be practical under field circumstances. So, um, so for us, it does render an animal immediately um, and sentient, which is most important. Uh, and once you des destroy the central nervous system, um, the uh, respiration and heart rate um, will immediately cease because those are involuntary um, processes. Um, so in a long response, that's why we shoot animals in the, we don't shoot them in the head, we shoot them in the center of the brain. So turning to some questions about non-lethal methods that your expertise might be helpful for, Tony, I'll give you three questions at once, actually. Are deer vasectomies really a thing, which you answered yes or no to that earlier, but maybe you can elaborate on that. Um, can you speak more to sterilization, and have you ever thought about putting an abortive fashion in salt blocks? Okay, so... Um as I mentioned in my uh, introduction and presentation, um, I've been actively involved in the development and testing of virtually every uh, injectable or implantable uh, fertility control agent. I've worked with all the active universities. Um, there's nothing out there that we're not aware of. Right now, Purdue is working with the Humane Society, trying to refine their PZP vaccine and how to moderate it where it'd be longer acting um, and have more or less uh, impact physiologically at the injection site. Um, so there's there's nothing we're missing, even though I consider our discipline fairly primitive. Um, we are very well connected. Uh, I know every scientist. Uh, I've read every manuscript, and I'm aware of every ongoing research project related to wildlife fertility control. Uh, and I can, I'm actually just finishing writing uh, the summation of all my sterilization research on female white-tailed deer. And the reason we appro approach females versus males is females are quite sedentary in the landscape. So those females that are eating your hostas, they're the same females. Um, and you go half mile away, those are different females, where males move more broadly in the landscape. Um, and you may have males from outside of city limits that we may not have access to if we were to do vasectomies um, that may come in and impregnate the females in the city. So the only reason we're doing vasectomies, and you can look up, there's some media coverage, uh, we're actually working on Staten Island New York, of all places. Um, it's 60 square miles, so it dwarfs your fine city of Iowa City. And we're capturing every male deer uh, 
last I checked, the guys just captured their 1,244th male deer and vasectomized it. Um, it's a massive undertaking. Um, in that environment, given the scale, um, and that it's an island, the males are an easier strategy. Um, not an easy project, but an easier strategy. Uh, extremely costly, over $4 million for this initiative, um, but we're effective. Um, after two years, our fawning is down uh, by 85%, uh, and after this year's uh, capture and treatment, we should uh, be negligible fawning on the entire island, considering we had almost 2,100 deer on the island when we started. Um, so you get an appreciation of what we can accomplish and what is feasible, um, and then the female-based programs are smaller scale, six square miles and smaller. Um, in these case studies that I'm summarizing, I've obviously gone back through all the literature, speaking to all my colleagues, um, referenced all the, the best science out there when you write a scientific manuscript uh, in our introduction and trying to understand the context of why people think, they think I promote sterilizing deer, and it's like, no, we don't have an injectable mechanism like we do in humans uh, or implantable mechanism that works. Um, there is nothing you can put orally uh, in a uh, food base that would reliably prevent deer from getting pregnant. Um, back in the 70s, they did the original research on trying to use steroidal agents in food, but they couldn't get the deer to eat the food continu continuously enough where they wouldn't drop hormone levels, come into estrus, and get impregnated. Plus, you get steroidal agents in the food chain, which is not acceptable at the state level. So um, we really are stuck with limited injectable agents and then someone like me running around um, doing ovariectomies on females. Um, and again, my objective is to understand, because there are proponents of non-lethal, um, what would really happen? I've tried to do this with vaccines for 20 years and pulled my hair out because I'm the one that has to capture these animals. It's not an easy undertaking. And so, and I have to catch them repeatedly. So you have the stress of the animal, the challenge of capturing them, and then it's my responsibility to uh, identify study areas that would give us the best data. And I can tell you, Iowa City um, is not conducive to a wholesale fertility control project because you're, the, ba the bottom line is your lot sizes are too big. Um, and getting to enough deer and capturing them and treating them um, would probably sink your entire city budget. So it's not as though I'm against it or, or, or dismissing uh, non-lethal, it's just not cost effective based on how your community is developed. Uh, and so I pick communities, I picked 11 communities across this country um, that kind of fit what I consider criteria to make this technology or this methodology, sterilization surgically is not great technology, um, but to make this methodology um, at least feasible in those landscapes where culling just isn't an option. We have many communities, super small lots, um, and high deer densities, very ineffectual to try to cull legal restrictions on culling. So, um, so we, we kind of tailor our, the methods that seem most suited to the circumstance. So, uh, and so basically, there is, they've been trying to work on an oral approach to contracept animals for longer than I've been around. Um, and the only thing they're working on right now is an oral treatment for feral pigs down south. And the only way they can do that is they can use a, a mechanical approach that precludes other non-target species from getting to the bait. Um, whereas, and so they can't use them where there's bears, because bears can also get in where pigs can get in. You'll get me going all night. But the point is, um, there are logistical constraints and considerations and technical considerations that would um, moderate what options you have available to you. Um, so we can do vasectomies. They would not work in your landscape. Sterilization could work, but it would be exceptionally expensive. Um, and sadly, tying into everyone wants a long-term solution, unless you pave Iowa City, you will always have deer, and deer will always reproduce. So you either live with the abundance of deer, which is fine, because I'm from Connecticut, um, and that's why it's all up to you collectively to decide what's an appropriate number of deer. Um, or you're gonna have some annual approach, whether that's an annual hunt, or that's a sharpshoot, there's gonna be some mechanism, the tree farmer gentleman, every year he's gonna be culling deer on his tree farm. Um, or everyone's property is gonna have to be fenced. And I've been, in, I've been in Hamptons I've worked, I've been in Princeton, I've been in many, many communities um, with a similar demographic, uh, similar level of education, or greater, um, they go down the fencing route and you end up with neighborhoods that are literally all fenced. And 
if people enjoy that, that's fine, but all those communities have soured to it uh, due to the aesthetic of everyone's property with at least eight foot fences. But again, Iowa City may choose to go that route. That's purely your, your prerogative. Thank you. So there's some questions here. I'm not sure we can answer everything in, in the scope of tonight, given the info that we have. But I, there's some questions I thought I would uh, throw the way the city staff or Jan, who was here with some history with this before. Um, so one of the questions that came up was, what expenditures is the city council willing to make? Uh, and I didn't know if we had any context about that that we would share here. We just know what it cost before, which was approaching $100,000, of which approximately $15,000 was to uh, package the meat with a local locker, and then that meat was given away at the crisis center. That's not an insignificant expense uh, of, of uh, the shooting of the deer that occurred over the years, but I think it was close to $95,000 the last year. What is happening with the health of the deer population? Is that one we can't answer and can't answer it? Okay. Well, Tony, you've um, you've seen them. What do you think? I just have the imagery we took during the, the survey, the photo surveys, and it's very difficult to ascertain to any degree of accuracy, you know, exact body weights, and um, so you couldn't really speak to that as a specific issue at this stage. Are there studies about how many deer can comfortably live in Hickory Hill Park? As the gentleman mentioned, it's probably on the low end of the spectrum. Um, depends whether you're trying to preserve herbaceous native plant species or wooded uh, vegetation. Uh, but the general rule is you need to have 20 deer per square mile or fewer um, in order to not have a substantial impact on your native uh, flora. Um, I'm trying to remember, Hickory Hill Park, 200 acres? About I think close. 180. Yeah, I'm just trying to make sure my memory's all right. Um, so basically, a third of of 20 animals is six animals. So, under the best from an ecological perspective, uh, Hickory Hill Park could sustain six deer. You probably have. 40 or 50 deer <laughs> easily in that area. Uh, basically, based on folks' observations, our camera surveys, uh, it would not surprise me if you don't have 80 deer per square mile uh, throughout much of that area that we surveyed. Um, and this one, I think, was based on an assumption that we ha we haven't been working to find a non-lethal solution, but there was a question about why has it not been a priority to find a non-lethal solution? So I don't know if, again, I'm looking at Sue and Jan. Well, we certainly spent a lot of time um, during the last Deer Task Force Committee um, looking at all the different solutions, all the different, I mean, you remember, Harold, um, hours and hours, and giving what we talked about as a, an appropriate carry, uh, carrying capacity in the number of deers per um, district. Um, well, we just came up with, if there are too many deer, we're probably going to have to kill them. And if we're going to kill them, we want to do it right and respectfully to them. And well, that's where we came up with the sharpshooting. Uh, Tony, if you could, um, do you have areas that have used a combination of methods? Uh, I think we, we, we've had a lot of opinions tonight, both with not managing it at all. So if you could speak to what Iowa City might look like five years from now, if, if you had a guess, if we don't do anything. Um, and you've already spoken about uh, uh, any sort of contraception or, or other ways of, of mitigating the population. Um, have you worked in areas where you've done sharpshooting and used other methods for maintenance after that? Is that something that's realistic or... Um, and if not, I also believe that the reason we're back here right now is that we stopped doing anything, and so now we're back to square one. So this is going to be an ongoing expense, the way I understand it. And if you could just speak to that, what's what's reasonable as a city for us to expect on a, on an annual basis? 
So we have communities. Um, so we do a combination. So much of my interest in, in uh, staying within a discipline is, is the research goals that I've established. And uh, so I like to work with fertility control and understand how we can impact populations. And by the way, we've had tremendous uh, success in these select areas. Um, we can get 10 to 20 percent population declines annually because I can capture over 98 percent of the females uh, in a community. Um, I would not say I could do that in Iowa City. Uh, I don't like to fail, so I would not come forward and promise you that that would be feasible. Um, we have areas where we're combining fertility control and lethal. Um, uh, so you can use more cost-effective means of lethal measures with uh, more uh, actually effective means in very dense neighborhoods where culling is not practical. Uh, we have several communities that we work with that uh, bow hunt during the regular season, and then we follow up with sharpshooting. Um, and the goal has been to displace us, which would be fine. Um, but bow hunters, even with four and five month seasons, um, with uh, unlimited tags, use of bait, everything you can imagine, uh, they can't get below 45 to per deer, deer per square mile. Um, so we usually come in after the entire bow season and we will kill twice as many deer um, in those same areas just so that the community can meet their objectives. So it doesn't mean it precludes bow hunting. It just means that bow hunting will not meet your goals unless your goals are, uh, your goal densities are, are higher than most communities can tolerate. Um, and that's a simple fact. I mean, and we've done that repeated. We've been in Princeton. We started Princeton the year before we worked here. I've been there ever since. They bow hunt, shotgun hunt every year, and we work there every year. Um, so it doesn't mean you can't do both. Um, it just really depends on what the community's tolerance is for methods and what their interest is for population density uh, as an outcome. So if you called the deer population professionally, got it down to your goal density, which we were around 25 deer per square mile, there's, you can't even maintain that with archery. Would not be feasible. Um, just unfortunately. And in your looking at Iowa City, is there, um, is there a unique part? Because one, one thing that we've seen is that Iowa City is the only city that doesn't use bow hunting in the state of Iowa uh, that has this, this issue. Is there something unique about our properties here? You've been on a lot of them, and, and I know with Iowa in general, there's a lot of private property, so um, getting access is a big is a big issue. Is there is that also an issue uh, here in Iowa City, or just in, in general, like places where someone would even feasibly be able to hunt, for instance? No, you certainly can hunt many properties in, in Iowa City. Um, but even when I was monitoring Coralville's program um, when we were here 10 years ago, uh, it's really what the community is willing to tolerate. So many communities that I visit um, don't want to spend money, so they're willing to accept whatever level of achievement hunting can achieve. Right, so that's so if they have 80 deer per square mile and they don't want to spend money, then they live with it and they're happy. Um, but it's really that tolerance threshold is, is what's going to really confound um, where you want to be. And if you want to be at 25 deer per square mile, I can tell you clear as day that there is no way you're getting there uh, unless you saturate this entire community with archery hunt, uh, with uh, with shotgun hunters. Um, we have a shotgun program on a 2,000 acre property in New Jersey, private state, and uh, there they cannot get below 40 deer per square mile with shotguns unless they can get out and do drives and push deer out of the areas that, and this is the same, they have access to this entire property. This isn't refugia with multiple landowners. They have to get out and do drives, which are conventional hunting methods. I'm sure it's used quite frequently in Iowa um, with firearms. Um, and they require those intensive drive opportunities, which would not going to happen in Iowa City and nor with a firearm, and they're barely getting below 30 deer per square mile. So it just puts in perspective what is achievable number-wise, right, versus what to, which you desire as a, as a community from its vegetation in the forest, whether it's landowner complaints, whether it's deer vehicle collisions. And in Coralville, they had very poor population estimates, but based on the harvest numbers, they were well over 80 deer per square mile. They were culling every year and killing 100 deer, but you know, it's really meaningless unless uh, you know, they're able to cull to a, uh, uh, a level that the community is accepting of. In Coralville, obviously, is accepting or doesn't want to uh, expend resources to manage deer. Thanks. 
So we asked quite a few of the questions that came up tonight in the public forum, but folks who weren't able to attend also had the chance to submit questions um, to Sergeant Frank. So we'll address some of those now because they may be questions you all have and information that we want to make sure gets addressed tonight. So um, I perhaps should have started with this one. Uh, what are the goals of the City Deer Population Management Committee? Is it the absence of all animals, a specific percentage population reduction, or a specific percentage slowing of the growth rate, or zero population growth? I think I can answer that one. Um, our goal here is to, again, seek input from you folks, take the experiences of the staff that's on the committee and the citizens who are on the committee who represent a variety of perspectives, and then get that information back to the city council. The, the committee is not making a decision about what's going to happen with things. The council will make that decision. Obviously, the council has made some preliminary decisions um, about what they want to do. Um, they have asked us at the same time to have the input from the community and to, to look at things and provide additional input to them. They, in turn, will look at it again and make a decision on whether they want to move forward in a particular direction. Um, so the, goal, the, the goals of this committee are to collect information and to provide information to the council. Uh, if used, where will the sharpshooters be located? In neighborhoods, how close to homes will deer be allowed to be killed? I can speak from a historical context. Um, we work both on um, public land as well as private lands. And there's a, a 50 yard or 150 foot setback from occupied dwellings. So if you're going to discharge a firearm as part of the program within 150 feet of an occupied dwelling, we would need permission from that landowner. And obviously just 50 yards isn't a great distance from a discretionary perspective. So all our cooperators, we ensure that anyone within view uh, or immediate neighbors is in full support because we don't want to create uh, bad neighborly relations just over managing deer. Will this occur in the evening or during the day, and how will it affect um, park closures? Um, typically, we try to work around the public spaces and work on private property, um, and so we minimize those interferences. But we typically start working a couple hours before dark when deer are habitually moving, and we take advantage of those movement patterns to optimize our efficiency. And then we'll work, again, depending on time of year, so a couple hours before dark until two or three hours after dark. Uh, kind of circle back, and those are what we call seated locations, but then we may be active in a vehicle um, in areas where that, that's a suitable method, which would be in their eastern portion of the community. The city does not expect park closures as a result of this? I don't think that's been decided yet, and I don't know the history that it was done before. Other communities do that regularly, though. We've never closed the park. No. Uh, I think in what you've shared so far, Tony, you've talked about how you work with property owners, but there was a question here about what if I don't want killing of deer in my property? I mean, when it's private property, you have to get permission to work there. Is that correct? Absolutely. So um, we work very closely with our landowners that are uh, a couple of things. One, they have to be supportive of the program. Um, and then two, it has to be suitable work area, right? It has to be safe, uh, has to be discreet, um, and ensure that we have the access we need to impact the population across the community. Um, so absolutely, we, we don't go on anyone's property um, without absolute permission. It'd be kind of hard to hide carrying five gallon buckets of corn into somebody's yard every day. So um, no, we all. Even all those proximate properties, they're all very aware of our activities, and we only even access the area to extract them. We may access them through someone's property if you have a steep embankment um, from where we're working. Uh, but we have written permission from, from those adjoining neighbors as well to, to access uh, our points of, uh, of, uh, of culling, um, regardless of where we are. Mm -hmm. Liz, maybe you can speak to this one. Uh, I don't understand the discussion of a deer no feed policy. If we can have bird feeders, why can't we feed cracked corn to deer in the backyard? The city currently doesn't have any ordinances that restrict the feeding of deer right now. So sounds like maybe they were th talking about if there was such a deer no feed policy. So, so currently we aren't. We haven't discussed uh, incorporating that. There, there have been some situations earlier in the year where uh, citizens were um, putting deer food out in public areas, in parks and things like that, which is 
that's basically that's considered littering by law. So, but on private property, um, there aren't there's no ordinance, anti feed ordinance or restrictions. I think we're good. I'm looking through. Mm hmm. So just to be clear, everyone, there's lots of these questions that folks either already asked in this setting or were addressed as we discussed other points. Um, so can the committee provide data on the reproductive rate, sex ratio, mortality rate, and immigration rate of the site-specific population? We got some of that earlier. I think some of that was pretty detailed, and I don't know that we're able to provide that in this um, setting. Has a sharpshooter call already been decided upon and planned, or are there, are there other more humane populations control methods being researched and considered. We've discussed that. Um, this one, I don't know if it's possible to answer. If no population control methods are implemented, what would likely occur to other plant and animal, animal life in the city? I mean, I guess that's sort of conjecture at this point, right? So. Hey, Laura, there was a question earlier about um, the type of ammo used. And I don't oh, know. Oh, lead, that I heard the that toxicity answer. of lead, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you can look at the, uh, the projectile configuration from a couple different perspectives. So the primary is you need to have a, a projectile that's very frangible, meaning that an impact it breaks into very small pieces because public safety is priority. Uh, you can get those projectiles both in lead core as well as non lead core. They'll use tungsten or, or other alloys. Um, uh, for use in uh, small caliber applications. So the research has been done. There was concern for hunters using lead core bullets. If you're shooting an animal, and as hunters typically do in a thoracic cavity, as those bullets fragment, you get these very small slivers of lead that get in the meat. So they've done um, pretty interesting and very thorough research doing radiographs not only of packaged meat, but also whole carcasses and looked at how that lead moves throughout the tissue. Um, but they also did research showing that if you shoot an animal in the brain, uh, that that lead only stays within the head cavity so that you don't get the, the contamination of the meat. Um, so you can use either way. The, the, the challenge with using non-lead um, projectiles is they're not as frangible. Um, they don't break up as well as, as lead core. So. But if we've had to work in national parks where it's lead only, I have some custom made business bullets um, that aren't lead core. They're reasonably frangible. They're very, you know, it's an option. Just depends on whether you weigh safety more than, um, you know, as one of my gentlemen says, it, the number of lead weights that come off car tires in your community is going to be way more than any lead that may be left in the landscape. So when we extract that animal, I'd say 95 or probably more percentage of that lead is within the head, and that gets disposed of, and it doesn't get into any of the consumable meat. That's another benefit of shooting an animal in the brain versus anywhere else in the, in the, uh, in the body. Tony, I remember last time around, um, there were some questions about using um, sound suppression. The only word I could remember is silencers, and I know you don't use that, but um, is that something that you still do? Yeah, so that, that's still a regular part of our, our uh, equipment. There were, uh, when I first started in, uh, in 1995, there were nine states where citizens could not possess, legally possess suppressors. Uh, that is now down to um, four states. Um, and Iowa had changed their law, in fact. Uh, Minnesota just changed in the last couple of years. Um, so yes, yeah, so all of our equipment is, uh, would be suppressed. Uh, there's still noise associated with a s suppressed supersonic projectile. Uh, those bullets, as they, just like the Concorde, while they stop flying it, right? As soon as you break the speed of sound, you get a sonic crack. So you will get some resonance of noise, uh, but it's much reduced relative to the, the, we call the muzzle blast, which is the combustion of the powder. Um, so basically it serves as a muffler on your car is all it's doing, but the projectile itself, um, I don't know if anyone's Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, if you shoot a 22 rifle, target rifle, it'll sound like that versus what a normal uh, centerfire rifle sounds like, which is quite loud. So it's, it reduces it, it doesn't eliminate it as some people envision. Someone had a question about, is the city liable for the health risk of the deer to the people? No. <laughs> Liz, could you say a few words about ticks and Lyme disease? You know, I'm, I, 
I've only done a little bit of Google research, and so I'm really probably not expert enough to speak on that. I do understand that um, field mice are, are the major carrier of ticks that have Lyme disease, um, but you know I'm not a epidemiologist, or so I'm I'm probably not the, the best person to speak about that. I can, I can fill in a little. I've, I've been working on Lyme disease research for 23 years now, and uh, I've worked with all the, the best scientists that look at population level effects and ecology of of, of uh, ticks. Lyme, you know, you got babesiosis, you have several um, ehrlichiosis. There's new diseases they're finding associated with ticks. Um, they just found a new tick. In fact, on Staten Island, I'm working with Columbia University, um, doing some some monitoring of Lyme disease uh, risks on in uh, on Staten Island. But nonetheless, the point is, um, it's it's a little more complex. So the the small mammals, which are your white-footed mice, chipmunks, voles, uh, they are a reservoir. So within their blood, within their body, they have the spirochete for Lyme disease. So when the deer ticks feed on them, there's three stages of a deer tick, right? There's a larvae, a nymph, and an adult. So the, the younger ticks, the, the larvae and nymphs, will feed on these smaller mammals, and that's where they um, uptake the spirochete. And then as they morph into the next life stage, they contain that spirochete, so if they get a blood meal from a human, they can transmit it. The deer come into play, and that deer are the primary um, source for a blood meal for the adults. So adults are bigger, they need a bigger blood meal, they lay two, 3,000 eggs, um, and so without deer, there's not enough large mammal hosts to sustain the tick population. So deer don't have the, they're not a reservoir for the disease, the spirochete itself, but the tick population wouldn't persist without an abundance of deer as that blood meal and the adult phase. So that's the confusion. People talk about mice and deal. So we've demonstrated, for example, on an island in Maine, um, over 20 years ago now, uh, we eliminated deer from the island. And, uh, and they had a super abundance of ticks and Lyme disease. And now there's scarcely some larvae that show up or nymphs from migratory birds that come by that island. But there are, there's no persisting uh, tick population on that island. And they've shown correlations between de decreases in deer. The trick is, even in like Iowa City, the theory, the best theory, is you need to get below eight deer, eight to 10 deer per square mile to have a few enough deer in the landscape, which would match up well ecologically with the forest health so that there's not enough big animals, deer, for the ticks to feed on to perpetuate the population. So the question is, can you actually reduce deer enough to impact Lyme disease? And no one, we're, I'm working on a study site right now in Maine uh, where I intend to, to study that very effect where they have a super abundance of deer, uh, some of the highest uh, rates of Lyme disease in Maine, and I'm gonna go depopulate a good portion of that island and work with Maine Medical Institute to see if we can uh, decrease, um, they already have good case studies on case of Lyme disease, but how many ticks are in the landscape and how those cases of Lyme disease will, uh, will decline in the future. So uh, anyway, sorry I was long-winded, but you know, that's another part of our, our, uh, our focus with uh, deer abundance and, and disease risk for humans. Tony, someone asked about conflicts of interest earlier. Can you speak to any conflicts of interest you might have in this situation? Um, I don't know. I mean, we provide a service. You guys obviously have an abundance of deer, or else you wouldn't have reached out to me. I don't solicit. I don't go to people and see if they have deer that need to be managed. But you're welcome to see our raw data. You can see our photographs. You can analyze our photographs yourselves if you'd like. Um, so yeah, we don't, I mean, it, there's a perception. I'm happy if someone else go do. The amount is the absolute numbers that we calculated uh, are only relevant to discussions on permitting. Are we going to call 50 deer? Or are we going to kill 200 deer? Um, only you know. I mean, I, I went to, and I don't want to belabor your evening, but I, I was uh, brought into Fairfax City, Virginia, and I've worked culling deer in that uh, county, and they'll easily have 100 deer per square mile. I looked at that community on Google Earth, and I said, Phew. This is going to be crazy. Six square miles is probably 100 deer per square mile. I'm like, I'm going to have to sterilize 350 or 400 females. I'm like, this is an insane project. I have a deer problem. I showed up. I spotlighted for three nights in October, beautiful evenings. And one of the core problems was this military country club. Three nights in a row, I drove around in a golf cart for four hours, plus the entire community, until sunrise. I saw no deer on the golf course. And I saw a total in three nights of 11 deer. I've never seen that 
few deer anywhere, never mind with a deer problem. But Fairfax City had a deer problem. We've been in the last five years. We've been sterilizing deer. I've captured every deer in five square, in six square miles, and we've actually reduced the population further. So the point is, absolute numbers of deer, in terms of what numbers I'm giving you, don't mean anything. Right? Only you know that right now, too many plants are being eaten, or deer vehicle collisions are a concern. So um, yeah, you can go hire someone else as well. I mean, this is, uh, you guys have been great to me, and I appreciate the opportunity to work out here, but it's really your prerogative to decide how you're going to manage deer short and long term. Well, and actually, that was going to be my next question, because we had a discussion as a committee about, like, okay, white buffalo. Like, why white buffalo? Folks in the room and who watch later might be wondering, like, why are you the person sitting here? Are there other companies out in the states that are doing this work? Um... Not really, but it, it's hard to do this type of work. Um, there's a federal government does it. So there's a federal government um, which is called USDA Wildlife Services, and they do some similar work uh, to us. Uh, there's been other companies that have tried to do what we do um, under the premise that they could sustain an organization. The challenge with what we do is um, I work in one place in Iowa. I work in one place in Missouri. I've got two places in New York. I've down in Virginia. You have to live on the road. You have to have the technical expertise. You have to have the, the ability to be mobile with a team. You have to keep that team active and skilled and up to speed with enough projects. It doesn't exist. I've had three people on my team for the first 21 years, and we covered the entire United States of the wildlife services. So there's just not enough demand to support uh, organizations with the capacity to, to do what we do. Um, and the only reason we have a larger staff now is because Staten Island and, and the near lunacy of, of trying to capture every male deer in, in 60 square miles. But uh, nonetheless, um, yeah, so there's really not many folks that have the, it's really the, um, try to remain humble and have some humility, um, but I've captured over 4,000 deer. I've captured probably 20 different species around the world. We've culled tens of thousands of animals with a multitude of methods. Um, you know, there's, we, I, I build and design projectiles, firearms, capture equipment. This is all we do. Um, and I do take pride in our capacity and knowledge uh, to bring forth expertise to communities like yourself. And uh, we don't take great pleasure. I do take great pleasure in solving problems. Um, hence why Staten Island was a treat to me. Uh, it's probably the most complex wildlife management situation anywhere, probably in the world, um, that we're taking on. Uh, and, uh, and so for me, that's really the, um, what keeps me going in, in, uh, in our discipline. But anyway, and I can refer to you other folks, you know, whatever you'd like to do, but um, we still know all your landowners. <laughs> Does anyone on the committee have any questions beyond that? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Because we have an expert here, I would just ask you to describe, you, you have sharpshooters. I'm, I'm assuming they're expert marksmen, so they can hit their target. The difference for the deer between that and just any old Joe with a bow and an arrow. Tell me how the deer die, how long it takes them to die. Please contrast those two. So there's always, you, know, you have a tool, and then you have a skill, right? So uh, the best data we have relative to archery in situations where they have uh, done proficiency tests, so not just folks that have a hunting license, but have actually shown some degree of competency, um, nearly one out of five animals that are impacted will not be retrieved. Um, um, your blood loss from proper shot placement with an arrow to the point of, ins of um, insensibility would be between 10 and 15 seconds thereabouts. So you can have what we call, that's called a good death um, through AVMA, um, a well-placed firearm or archery projectile. Um, it's different than euthanasia, right? Those are two different standards or expectations based on the tool. Uh, for us, um, I've been out with many state wildlife people. Um, everyone we work with comes with us, uh, supervises our activities. Um, 
I try to take things personally, but I'd like to see a video of us crippling deer, because I'd be on the internet if it existed. Um, that's why we also shoot for the center of brain, um, because due to the, the projectiles that we use and the caliber that we use, the animal's either immediately incapacitated uh, or you miss, so typically they move. So we miss about one out of 50 times, uh, and that's just a poor timing. Um, so you're trying to figure out when that animal's gonna be stationary enough where you can engage it. Um, and so there's clearly a difference in, in that we will term humaneness um, with the two tools. But it doesn't mean they're less and we're better. Um, why do this for a profession? I literally shoot every day. Um, my staff shoots extensively. And um, we have equipment that is going to be far more precise than archery tackle. I mean, I hate to say this, but there's a reason the Native Americans lost, right? I mean, you go out there with a bow, it's very primitive. I mean, as fancy as they are now, and I've shot archery tackle since I was 16 years old, it's still very primitive in terms of the, the, the mechanics relative to a centerfire rifle. So, um, but that's a, a personal decision, a personal preference. Um, some people value the difference between the instantaneous death and something that, in a good circumstance, takes 10 to 15 seconds. Um, you know, and that's a per, you know, personal choice relative to that outcome. And I don't pass judgment on how people, I don't pass judgment on whether people choose to eat meat or not eat meat, um, or whether it's killed as a bow hunter and eat venison, or whether you go to the supermarket. So I don't pass judgment on how you value that. But there's no question, you can't euthanize a deer reliably with archery tackle. It's, it's not possible. So you're saying one out of five is not retrieved, so they're running around with an arrow in them? Is that what you're saying? Could be more serious, could be less. Could be a, a, a pass, you know, just a passing shot with a laceration. Could be an arrow embedded uh, in the animal. Could be a pass through that didn't hit the vital tissue. Um, but those are not my data. Those are data from elsewhere. And I would guarantee I've, I've run seven hunts um, and watched um, proficiency tested individuals conduct themselves um, in highly supervised circumstances. And, uh, you're not going to get optimal outcomes. It's just this is not a reality. I just wanted the public to understand the difference, so I appreciate that. You're welcome. I think we're going to go ahead and cut that off at this point, the comment aspect of things, and go ahead and wrap things up. Does anyone from the committee have questions that that remain? Okay. Um, I'd like yes. to ask one more question about bow hunting. Is that would that occur during the day then? Is that a difference for you bow hunters? Because you have to have daylight. And so again, you would be asking for people for private property to come into their property and shoot with a bow and arrow during the day. Yes. Okay. Have we heard the DNR stance on this tonight? Or if they're willing to speak about it, I guess? I think at this point, um, certainly we have guests from the DNR here tonight that are here to listen to what we have to say. I don't know that we're going to ask them to come up and make comment on things. So we'll leave it at that at this point. So if you want to speak with them afterwards, certainly you can. Anything else from the committee? Tony, anything else you want to say? Um, I'm obviously available at future times for more information. I can send as much literature or contact information as you like on any matters that may come up for further discussion. Excellent. Thank you for having me out. I, I appreciate the opportunity. I do enjoy working in Iowa City. I uh, appreciate everyone coming. And for those of you who stuck it out to the very end, appreciate that as well. Um, this is available again on Channel 4 if you want to rewatch some of it, uh, want to hear more about that. And certainly city staff will be around for a little while afterwards as well. And uh, you can certainly reach us by email. So thank you very much for your time.